The reason why Antarctica is the windiest is down to its geographies. So if we think about our tricellular model and we think about our Hadley feral and polar cells, three identical cells in both of the hemispheres, and we think about the influence of the sun, we would expect the regions furthest away from the equator to be coldest. The sun is going to be uh, at its weakest in the two up here. And we would expect that to find uh, some snow and ice at both of the poles. If we look at the two poles, though, their physical geographies vary enormously. Uh, here's an image of uh, Antarctica in the South Pole. And we'll notice that Antarctica is a landmass surrounded by oceans. Underneath is an image of the Arctic up on the North Pole. And you will notice that the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by landmass. So if we think about what the Arctic looks like in 3D, the Arctic looks like this. Here's an ocean with landmasses on either side. And all we have floating around in the Arctic are small bits of sea ice. That sea ice is only a few uh, meters in thickness. If we have a look at what we would expect in the Antarctic, the Antarctic works the other way around. So we have oceans surrounding a landmass. And at the South Pole on here, we actually have a huge gray ice cap that sits on top of that, that is several kilometers thick in the middle of it. Now, earlier in the course, we learned about uh, the fact that as we go higher up uh, a mountain, our lapse rate means that we lose about one degree Celsius for every 150 meters we go up. So uh, with our land mass down in Antarctica, uh, we would expect for a, an ice cap that is several kilometers uh, thick, we'd expect the temperatures on top of that ice cap to be considerably lower than we would expect the temperature to be on that floating sea ice uh, in the Arctic that is only a couple of meters above sea level. So we know, first of all, that uh, the Antarctic is going to be much, much colder. Now we need to think about um, what's going to happen to the air parcels that sit on top of the ice mass. So if the air parcels on top of the ice mass up here are really cold, um, we know that warm air rises, it normally rises and often cools and condenses to form relief rainfall on our, um, on our mountain ranges, but we know that cold, dense air falls. So if we've got this uh, cold air mass that's on top of the ice caps, really high up uh, and very, very dense. It's trying to get to the edge of the ice caps and it's trying to pour down into the lower altitudes uh, and out onto the oceans. As well as uh, this impact here, right on the very bottom part on the South Pole, we've obviously got two polar cells working together and we've got above the South Pole, we've got this falling air uh, anyway. So not only are we in between the two polar cells, and therefore getting loads of falling air, but we've also got the impact of this denser uh, air spilling out. So without any obstructions in the way over the top of the ice cap, we will have uh, um, we will have wind speeds picking up to huge uh, huge volumes across here. Um, these are called catabatic catabatic uh, winds, and those are the winds that come from the high altitude, really cold interior uh, of the continent and spill down into the lower altitudes on the outsides. That's why whenever you're watching uh, everyone's favourite geographer, uh, the legend that is Attenborough, narrating some poor penguins that are getting absolutely battered by a load of winds, that's exactly the process that's happening here. It's those huge catabatic winds that are, um, are flowing over the surface. So that's why our windiest location around the world is Cape Denison uh, in Antarctica. And Cape Denison uh, saw back in 1912 a whole uh, hour it was the windiest hour ever on record, and the average wind speed over the entire hour was 153 kilometers per hour.